Right, it's that time of year again. Look, most of us are adults. We don't enjoy it anymore. It's just more money to spend. So let's just grit our teeth and get through this. Also, what I mean to say is that it is that time of year again and it's time to celebrate festivities. So I thought we could go through what I think are some of the coolest discoveries of 2023. I'm not going to stand in ceremony here, so let's just get straight into it. First discovery on this list is a big one. Literally. Back in the summer, a paper was published on some remains found in the Paracas Formation of Peru. These remains were a few vertebrae and ribs from a basilosaurid, which are an archaic group of whales, and they named it as a new genus and species, Perucetus colossus. Now, Perucetus has proved a game-changing discovery thus far, and it has been talked about extensively in paleo communities, namely because of its size. Now, whales have always been the group that held the monopoly on the biggest animals to ever live alongside sauropods, as the group simply doesn't do small. Today's blue whale has always been cited as the biggest animal to ever live in Earth's history, but Perucetus has potentially challenged that idea with size estimates possibly exceeding the largest blue whales by up to 140 tonnes. Now blue whales weigh up to nearly 200 tonnes and maximum weight estimates for Perucetus reach 340. But the authors did state a likely average for individuals being around the same as blue whales. Now as I've mentioned here, size estimates become even more excessively difficult than they already are for animals of this size, given the limited remains. And more often than not, when an animal is published as the biggest, further studies do call this into question. So Perucetus' crown is not on its head securely, but the fact that it's possible means that the biological limits of animal size far exceed what we once thought. Now Perucetus does deserve its own video, which I'll be doing in the new year, but for now let's move on. Now, our next bit of news of this year comes from Dartmouth College when back in November a new study was published on the extinction of the dinosaurs. Now a lot of people are familiar with the idea of an asteroid hitting Earth and killing off the non-avian dinosaurs, but in my Cretaceous video I did mention another hypothesis. Around the same time there was a period of slow volcanism in India, creating lava fields that stretched for miles upon miles. This volcanism created an igneous province known as the Deccan Traps. And at this magnitude and length of time, the amount of carbon released by such an event could have had cataclysmic consequences as we've seen in other extinctions. Now ideas have undulated around the trap's contribution to the KPG mass extinction, from being the sole cause, to helping contribute it, to having not much effect at all, or even actually being caused by the asteroid impact. Now this study actually used AI to create models of this extinction event and the creation of the Deacon Traps in an effort to remove human bias from the debate. And it actually found that this volcanism alone could have caused the extinction of the non-even dinosaurs. Now don't get me wrong, no one is saying that this asteroid didn't hit Earth and that it wouldn't have had really devastating consequences. But this study seems to suggest that if it didn't hit Earth, the dinosaurs still would have been pretty screwed. Now we all remember the Therizinosaurus from Jurassic World 3 with its beak and scythe-like hand claws, but it turns out there was also a pterosaur that was pretty similar. Technically a pterosaur morph, but close enough. In the Santa Maria Formation from late Triassic Brazil lived Venetoraptor Gassene. Now This little guy was only just over a foot tall and at a glance pretty much looked like a dinosaur. But this was actually more closely related to pterosaurs, and believe it or not, most pterosaur morphs look more dinosaur-like, with pterosaurs being the highly derived weirdos. Venetoraptor was seen to have a recurved beak, tiny teeth, and relatively large hand claws, but how this was used or even what it ate remains unknown. Oh, now here is a lot of one that gained quite a bit of attention. For those that don't know, Irritator Challenger is a Spinosaurid named in 1996 from the early Cretaceous Romualdo Formation of Brazil, named because of the irritating condition that the fossils were handed over in. Well, back in May, CT scans were taken of this Spinosaur and amongst the information was some surprises regarding the lower jaw. 
Biomechanical studies show the Irritator actually had a relatively weak but quick bite and the lower jaw itself was actually able to spread laterally. Now of course this led to a tsunami of paleo art depicting Irritator horrifically spreading out its mouth like Predator with a subsequent influx of discussion in the paleo community. For those not aware, this kind of image is not the case. Just to clarify, this widening of the jaw primarily served to widen the pharynx for a big gulp, similar to what is seen in pelicans, but possibly not as exaggerated. This method of feeding likely meant the irritator would feed on small fish and vertebrates within freshwater systems, snapping them up quickly in massive gulps and swallowing the prey whole. Speaking of feeding... The mosasaur was named back in May as Stellodens mysteriosus. Ooh. Material of this mosasaur was first found in the Uled Abdown Basin of Morocco, of which consisted of partial dentary bones and the most interesting part of this mosasaur, the strange teeth. Now Stellodens teeth were really weird due to the fact that they were pretty much Phillips head screwdrivers. Looking from the top down, the teeth had serrated ridges going all around the tooth, giving it a star-like appearance. Now these are unlike any other teeth found in other vertebrates, so it must have been doing something pretty special with these teeth. As to what, we simply have no idea. All we can do is hope that we find more complete specimens that tell us more about what this mysterious mosasaur was actually doing. Now the next study comes under 2023, barely because it was actually submitted at the end of 2022, but technically it was published in January of 2023. I just wanted to talk about it. Now this is another study that got a lot of attention and talk, as with any study that takes a really famous dinosaur and makes a very bold statement. Neuroscientists published a study looking at theropod dinosaurs, of which the main example used was obviously T-Rex in which it was found that many had similar numbers of telencephalic neurons to that of primates. So how the hell was this found out? Well, the brain case of any animal will usually take the scaled up shape of the brain itself, meaning you can get a pretty good idea of an animal's brain if you have an intact enough fossil of the cranium. And this study also proposed that various correlations exist between brain size and neuron number, depending on which group we're talking about. So if we know the ratio of brain size to neuron number for, say, archosaurs, we can estimate those of extinct animals. The paper concluded that, and I quote, Theropods such as Tyrannosaurus and Allosaurus were endotherms, with baboon and monkey-like numbers of telencephalic neurons respectively, which would make these animals not only giant, but also long-lived and endowed with flexible cognition, and thus even more magnificent predators than previously thought. Dr. Herselena Huzel, who performed this study, even said that T-Rex had the intelligence to use tools and pass on knowledge to offspring. But many have seen this as a bit far-fetched, especially since it's only based on one extrapolation. But let's take a look at some new dinosaurs now. The first up we have a Ceratopsian, which I picked because, well, I like its name, and I don't think I need any more justification than that. Say hello to Gremlin Slobodorum. Great, right? Gremlin was a type of Leptoceratopsid, which is a group of Ceratopsians that were notably smaller and more basal than others. This particular Ceratopsian held from the Campanian age of the Late Cretaceous around 77 million years ago in modern day Canada. <laughs> Now our next story is one concerning those pretty dinosaur coats. Back in September, 125 million year old feathers from Sinornithosaurus and Confucianus were studied using x-rays in infrared light. The results showed that these contained fossilized remains of the same beta proteins found in modern day birds that are used to strengthen those feathers for flight. Now similar studies have been done before, but they actually only found alpha proteins in non-avian dinosaur feathers. But this study has come pretty close to all but confirming that birds did actually descend from non-avian dinosaurs. In case there were still any doubters out there. But the study did also note that the presence of beta proteins could also be a result of taphonomy rather than presence on the live animal. In other words, the process of fossilization could have broken down some or all of the proteins present on the live animal over millions of years. 
throwing the results off and showing the need for yet again more study. But you know, I mean, what other type of animal has feathers? Like, the f more do you want? And now we're going to concern ourselves with a classic. Troodon was a small to medium sized Silurosaur that was very closely related to Dromaeosaurs or Raptors. This particular dinosaur and the whole group of Troodontids have been cited for decades as being the real life ultra intelligent dinosaurs that could have apparently inherited the earth by developing humanoid bodies that were both ridiculous and terrifying in equal parts. I don't, I don't know why someone thought that the human body plan is the only one in all of existence that's capable of inheriting the planet, but I digress. Now, Troodon itself is actually a dubious genus. Try saying that while Christmas drunk. Which is a whole discussion in and of itself. But it's long been speculated that this dinosaur was actually omnivorous. Mostly due to the fact that this group has some really strange teeth. They were sharp like a carnivore, but the serrations you can see are actually pretty much nothing like the serrations seen on other carnivorous dinosaurs. And slightly more like the plant eating serrations. Well, this study has officially confirmed that theory to be true. You see, looking at an extinct animal's teeth is not the only way that you can find out what it ate. Everything an animal eats gets absorbed into the body, including the different isotopes that exist in meat and plants. Now, these isotopes were studied within Trudontid remains, and it actually shows a mixture of isotopes seen in both herbivores and carnivores. Now, of course, that's not to say that it wasn't just swallowing herbivores whole along with its gut contents. But in my opinion, along with the teeth, this lends a lot of ammunition to the omnivory theory. Lastly, we're smashing up some preconceptions on dinosaur eggs. Now, when we think of eggs, we think of the hard shells that you can crack and then break away into shards. But this is actually a really weird feature in amniotes. Now that's because most amnio eggs that are laid, as opposed to live birth given, are actually soft-shelled. The only consistent exception to this is archosaurs such as crocodilians and dinosaurs, and in turn birds. But a study was released back in November showcasing the eggs of an early Jurassic sauropodomorph from China, which would have been soft and leathery like turtle eggs. Now sauropods aren't just an incredibly big group, they're also an incredibly old group with sauropodomorphs being one of the very first major dinosaur groups to pop up during the late Triassic. This basically shows us that soft-shelled eggs are an ancestral trait of archosaurs that they evolved out of. Likely with dinosaurs, pterosaurs and crocodilians evolving them completely separately of each other. Whew. Okay. So unfortunately this has turned out a little bit like the Halloween video in that there is so many more things that I wanted to cover but it would result in a two hour long video and my laptop catching fire. So alas, any stories that I have missed out on will just have to be discussed down below in the comments or I'll get to them in relevant videos in 2024. But for now, Merry Christmas everyone and I'll catch you guys next year.